we get a bunch of questions about the Moxie, what types of findings you have, what the technology is. So we thought we'd create a little 10 minute video about what that is. If you're one of the people that ask questions, stay tuned and you, hopefully you learned something. Right, so we just wrapped up a physiological assessment with our athlete Colson who um, just came off of regionals. Before starting up her training for this next season, her coach Adam wanted us to go through some testing and kind of take a look under the hood and figure out what some of her limitations are and then subsequently how we could best train her and possibly do some things that might be contradicting to what you'd see in the market. So to kind of start and give some context, today we did a physiological assessment and we're trying to find what the limiting system in her body is. The test that we did with Colson today was a progressive step test. It was four minutes on and one minute off, starting at 200 watts on the assault bike and every other set we increased the wattage by 50 watts until failure. So when four minutes at 200, rest a minute, four at 200, rest a minute, then the next four minute set was at 250 and so on. At the point of failure on that step test, we had her do a Wingate desaturation test, which is 30 seconds all out on the bike. Rather than gaming it for the best score though, she starts by just ramping up the wattage as high as humanly possible and just hanging on to that as best that she can. So the reason that we do the 30 second piece at the end of the test is to see if at that state, if she could pull oxygen out of the muscle and completely desaturate it. If she could actually get that like neural drive and output to do that. Um, you could also even get an indicator to the athlete's psychology. If you see that they can't do it and the physiology is functioning fine and they don't do it, that's something that you have to question as well. We also get some data post-test. So after she does that really extreme bout, I could look at how long it takes her blood pressure to regulate itself how long it takes for her to resaturate oxygen in the muscle and just get an idea of um, what that looks like. To kind of simplify things and um, make it a little bit reductionist, we could say that there's three primary limitations. There is the um, utilization limitation, so that would manifest if an athlete's able to get blood and oxygen into the muscle, but they can't use that oxygen and they can't suck it into the mitochondria that's a utilization limitation, something that's just not really that common in CrossFit athletes, period. There's a respiratory limitation, so in a perfect world, the respiratory system could get O2 into the body at the correct rate and get CO2 out. A respiratory limitation manifests when that's not happening optimally. And then a cardiac or delivery limitation is when they're getting the O2 into the body and if it gets into the muscle, they're gonna utilize it, but a delivery limited athlete is quite literally limited in their ability to deliver that oxygen and blood to the muscle. So what we saw with Colson today is that she has the second and third. So she has a cardiac limitation mixed with a respiratory limitation with a little bit more beginner intermediate athletes or crossfitters in general. You'd often see one limitation, it would be pretty concrete, like they can't utilize oxygen, period, improve that and they'll get better at the sport. But with elite athletes like her, very high level CrossFitters, it's usually a little bit more like gray and fluid. So for her, the way that this manifests is that when the heart starts to come under fatigue, what happens is the brain needs to protect the heart from doing that because if a vital organ or critical system comes under failure, quite literally we're just gonna die. What happens is her brain sub-recruits the muscles in her body and makes them stop firing or like sending those signals. So that's a protective mechanism for her heart so it doesn't overwork itself. So it'd be akin to if you did 30 power cleans at 85% of your 1RM. At some point you just wouldn't be able to keep going. It's not because you're breathing so heavy or you're in all this pain or local metabolic stress. It's because your brain's not sending those signals anymore. A lot of times in the market, if you were looking at this kind of limitation, like a cardiac limitation, people address it in very, um, I don't want to say myopic, but like very simple ways. So they have like zoned energy system training, like zone one, zone two, zone three, zone four. And maybe they'll give them like zone one work or zone two work to address this like aerobic or endurance issue. But in reality, like biological systems aren't that simple. If you want to address a specific physiological limitation, you need to create interval structures that actually match 
the demand of that system. So in this case, we'd use what's called blended energy system training. So rather than doing like zone one work and then doing zone three work later, we're touching on every training zone within a given interval. So that allows us more flexibility and creativity construct intervals, um, sessions or training pieces that really stimulate these systems and those limitations to the highest degree so we could get as much adaptation there as possible and make it surgical so we're not wasting like any training time or volume on things that don't matter. Of course, there's like support pieces. Maybe that zone one or zone two work would help this and would serve to like support those adaptations, but that's not gonna make her better and that's not gonna transition to sport specific work. You could do like individual isolated training pieces all you want, but at the end of the day, if there's not some kind of bridge from that structural work to the performance-based work, then it's not gonna manifest as high-level um, work on the floor. I think that's something we even saw at regionals these past few weeks. This is also gonna give us some clues into how she compensates to training and how she adapts to training. So knowing these limitations, ultimately impacts everything she does because that is who she is like as an organism or as a person. We know that athletes with this type of limitation, oftentimes they tend to carry like a lot more muscular tension. Maybe they're like really tight in the quads or they're uh, bound up rotationally. If we know that, then we could put training pieces in play in addition to their sport specific work to mitigate some of those negative effects that they get with their developmental training, which really like all athletes across the board are gonna get that. There's like no free lunches in biology or in training. So anything that you're doing that's gonna have a positive effect will have an impact somewhere. So with the physiological testing that we're doing in these very surgical protocols, it's allowing us to get as much of that positive adaptation as possible and not spending like adaptation currency on things that don't matter or on protocols that might even be like maladaptive, doing things that you might see in the market that for an athlete with a certain limitation, it's actually gonna make them worse. That's something that I think could be pretty pervasive too, even with like supplementation, things that people kind of throw out as blanket statements, like do this type of training to improve this, take this supplement to improve this. A lot of those things work, and like you can't refute that, like the evidence shows that, but for athletes with certain physiological limitations, that might be like the complete opposite of what they need to do and it might make them worse. So knowing this information, it just allows us to really like take a scalpel and like cut through it versus just like taking a meat cleaver and like hacking at it and just... Right, so if you didn't understand a single word I just said, the one thing that I want you to take away from this video is that everything works, but it doesn't work for everyone. So depending on an athlete's physiological makeup and their limitations, there's going to be very specific protocols that work well for them that address those needs. And then there's gonna be other protocols and ways of training that while popular in the market and work for a lot of the elites, not only would those protocols not improve their performance, but it might also make them worse at the sport. At the end of the day, without actually looking under the hood and assessing someone's physiology, we're really just making educated guesses on what's going on under the hood. So using this technology, it allows us to cut out months of trying to figure out what the underlying limitation is, or even like making really educated guesses, even if they're correct, we could look see this is the issue, this is exactly how we train to kind of circumvent that and then put those into practice. That being said, if someone isn't an elite athlete and their sole focus is not to get better at the sport and compete, while I do think they still could get a lot out of doing these kinds of tests and we could definitely enhance their training, I don't think it's mandatory or something that they really need to like stress about or worry about because ultimately they're gonna be able to adapt to what they're doing and they're still gonna progress. And if they're not looking to be number one in the world, maybe that five to 10% advantage on the top end isn't so important for them. But on the other hand, you could also learn some crazy shit from it that ends up making you a ton better.